Uh, hey there, folks. We're all here, and welcome to another, as of yet, unnamed uh, podcast. Please leave your ideas. I'm here with John from Dragon Mind, and uh, today we're going to be talking about homebrew, particularly how much is too much, uh, when it makes sense to splinter off into a different system, uh, that sort of thing. Let's get it going. What made me ask this question about, like, what's the edge between heavily homebrewing a system and, like, creating your own system and being confident in your own system enough to sell it as a separate product stemmed from our discussion of the black flag reference document last week uh one of the comments in the on the download page was just interesting it was kind of snarky and it was just like this just feels like some bloggers homebrew as opposed to a separate system that can stand on its own two legs that's really where like this question came from okay so to, to kind of set a baseline uh now that black flag because that that blog post was back in february now that uh black flag has kind of gone through its uh its iterations it's uh had some play testing done i mean they're you know, they've already done the kickstarter and they're releasing books and blah 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 oh well this was on like the post last week oh like, was this it was okay. like a, this was a comment about the black flag reference document that like oh. came out so this gotcha. is a, it was, it was as we were actually discussing it, I, I scrolled down to the comments just to see what people were saying. So this is a very recent opinion. Okay, cool. Cause I, I definitely saw that uh, in some of the earlier posts as well. So yeah, yeah, it is what it is. But, uh, but just to set like a baseline, do you consider now Tales of the Valiant to be a, a separate system? So personally, I don't. And it's just because they haven't really changed enough of what I consider to be the core fifth edition engine to set it aside from what fifth edition offers. Yeah, their their class progression is a little different. Um, but I mean, even in baseline fifth edition, since the release of Tasha's, uh, there are several ways that you can either substitute class features from the baseline progression or add to it. Um, and to me, the Black Flag reference document, which is in a way kind of a sneak peek of what we're going to get with the full Tales of the Valiant product, it feels the same way. Like it feels like right. just like there's some additions we made to the Barbarian class. Um, but to me, the the main engine of 5th edition is the D20 resolution mechanic. So you try to roll high on a D20 um, and the action economy, movement, action, bonus action. If you're not significantly changing those parts of the engine, um, I, I don't find, I, I think there are parts of Black Flag that you can take out if you like it and implement them in a Dungeons and Dragons game and still get a very similar experience. So when I think about the the purpose of mechanics in the game, I, I think that they all kind of lend themselves to the themes of the of the game. And unless you adjust the scaffolding, I think it's very difficult to separate yourself or from the uh, the original, I guess, uh, ideas that you're you're kind of building off of, and because when you you mentioned the uh, the core resolution, you know, d twenty rollover, and uh, what was the other one? Oh, the action economy. Action economy. Um, right. Yeah, action movement bonus action as like the way that players interact with the class mechanics. Right. So I mean, this is a poor example, but Pathfinder very different from five e. Right. Uh, in part because it uses that separate um, action economy, a three round or three, uh, three, three, three actions three action round. economy. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, and, and that's like, that's wholly its own, but I think a large part of what makes Pathfinder Pathfinder is all of the surrounding structure as well. Like the, the yep. lore of their world, totally different. All of the, uh, the classes and, and characters and that sort of thing have some part uh, particular feels, but, um, and it's still like, uh, walks, uh, the same path as a uh, other heroic fantasy games and that it makes you feel awesome, but you know, a wholly different system despite being derived from 3.5. Mm -hmm. uh, if Pathfinder would have kept the uh, the turn economy in 3.5, I still, f I, like I have a sneaking suspicion that it may have still ended up feeling like a different system. That's, that's my take because there's like enough surrounding changes that, that it would feel um, more than just a, a different setting. Yeah, so I do know, having listened to um, Roll for Combat, which uh, one of the frequent speakers on it is Mark Seifer, who was one of the 
quote unquote engineers of second edition Pathfinder. The the sense I've gotten is when Pathfinder first edition came out, everyone was pretty much like, oh, it's like it's just 3.5, but with a different world. So like there wasn't a separate system for uh Pathfinder. Um as much as it was just, oh, we're gonna tweak some things. So in a way, Pathfinder first edition felt more like homebrew. What makes me say that Pathfinder second edition is its own unique isolated system is that you can't make a Pathfinder 2e character and bring it to a fifth edition D&D game. Like the action economy, the way characters progress, the different levels of proficiency, because they don't have just a flat proficiency bonus. Each individual skill and weapon and saving throw has it. You can have different proficiency levels uh, for each of those different aspects of your character sheet. Um, which I know I, I'm pretty sure Pathfinder first edition did as well, but so did D and D 3.5. So that, that's what makes me say that Pathfinder second edition is, is like its own separate system because again, a lot of the scaffolding has changed and, and this isn't to rag on Kobold press, but if you look at the black flag reference document, it has the same classes pretty much with the same type of leveling progression. Um, with the same abilities that they're drawing from. I could definitely see taking, I don't know, uh, a a spell from one of the 5th edition products and plugging it into my Black Flag game. And that was kind of part of their marketing pitch, is that they specifically said it is a 5e clone. So it's not really a separate system at that point. It's just, it's like an adjacent product. Right, this, uh, this quest for backwards compatibility is kind of, I think it's stymieing the development like the the clever creative development of you know uh, these these systems what do you think about distal then like is it a separate system given that it is d20 rollover uh, mm -hmm. and much like 3.5 has a differentiation between the the skills that you level up individually versus uh, other aspects of the, the character you you can't make a distal character and have it be compatible in a 5e game so it is built off of some of the scaffolding of 5e, but a lot of the internal math is its own thing. Um, it does borrow sort of the 5e action economy, right? You've got move, action, technique. Um, again, if it's not broken, you don't need to fix it. Right. Um, but I, the the thing, I guess, that you could also point to is how different is the math of the game. Um, I think I mentioned last time Pugmire which is also built off of the 5e OGL. Um, it also has almost exactly the 5e mechanics. The difference is the way you approach character building is very different. Like you said, Lord does have a place in it, but that's also part of what I was interested in exploring is like, if I have the same game, but I just have a different world, is it a different system? And to me, the answer right. is no. Because like Eberron, there are some Eberron specific things like the dragon marked houses that are like Eberron options, but that doesn't mean we're not playing D and D if we're playing an Eberron. For sure, you can homebrew the crap out of Five E, and it'll still feel like Five E. And I, I wonder why that is. Oh, okay, I, I should say like up to a point. There's caveats for everything. You know, you can chop mm -hmm. the the thing up into, into pieces. You hack the arms and the legs off, and um, you know, it's, it's something totally different. But um, but I wonder how much of that actually needs to to change. And I don't think that it's a resolution mechanics. And I don't think that it's uh, even... I, I don't even necessarily know that it's the math of the game either. I think it's enough components. And I'm not sure where that line lives. Because I, I think that there are uh, mechanics that you can kind of point to uh, in 5e that have, have heavier weight than others. So advantage, just as, a, as an example, is a mechanic that I think almost inherently makes you feel more heroic. If you got rid of uh, advantage as a mechanic, I mean, there'd be so many knock-on implications of of doing that, but that would be like one step toward toward a different game. I almost wonder, because I, I said this, not really thinking, but <laughs> like, I wonder if the line is, if someone were to use whatever rules for character creation and the character they bring is incompatible with the game the game's base version that that is kind of the <laughs> that's like the tone of backwards compatibility for the the 2024 core rules is right. you can bring a 2024 fighter 
and play alongside a 2014 fighter. They will not be balanced against each other. The 2024 fighter will have tighter mechanics, additional options, probably higher damage output. But in terms of the action, bonus action, movement economy, in terms of you know how an attack roll happens and what gets added to it and what doesn't, like they can, they they're compatible with each other. It's just not ideal um, so from like a balance perspective. The but way that like, they try to market yeah. that um, between like you'll you'll see Jeremy Crawford talk about backwards compatibility and like yeah you can play you know those other like they could play alongside each other and he says it with a really excited face because that's like I think that's his persona. Um, but I'm looking at it like no people aren't gonna do that they're not gonna like that it doesn't make sense to do that it's like this thread that they're holding on to because they made a promise at some point is is what it feels like to me yeah and again um you know if you listen to the lazy rpg podcast by mike shea he'll talk about the fact that if you buy level up advanced 5e uh tales of the valiant and the D D 2024 core rule books you can kind of like frankenstein your own custom 5e type game by borrowing rules from a lot of different toolboxes and while i admire his optimism toward that approach it can really easily get confusing and that's why i I don't think there's like a hard line answer of how much homebrew is too much um personally i've tried to run games where there's one or two homebrew rules like even just like i don't know um there's a there's a variant rule in the Dungeon Master's Guide where if you take more than uh, if you take a, too much damage, you have to roll for like system shock. So your system, your your pain receptors are lit up so much that you there's a potential that you get stunned. And even offering that one tweak, a lot of players were like, "Nah, I'm not down for that." Um, but I, you know, the, my latest home campaign has a lot of homebrew. There's a lot of custom options and there's a crafting system. And, um, we've changed a lot of aspects of how the game works. If you roll a nat one on a melee attack that provokes opportunity attacks and my players in that campaign are not overwhelmed by the large amount of homebrew tweaks I've made to this system. So I wonder if it's like a table roster by table roster thing. Yeah, it it might be. I mean, you you didn't like hit them with all those rules at the same time either, right? Like you were kind of bleeding that out uh, into the into the open, so you you can get a feel for it. They can get acclimated to it, and then they can like once they have the understanding, it's all it's all good. So I think when you're the difference between doing that and entering a new system, because a lot of games uh, like new systems started as homebrew. Like mm. you have accumulated enough homebrew ideas, uh, but eventually there needs to be some sort of decision point. Well, I, I shouldn't say needs to be, but like there may as well be because uh, you you were essentially playing a different um, different experience. So given that you were continuing to to experiment with these rules, play with a particular group, they were already on board. And when I think of creating a new system, you are at the baseline setting the expectations right out the gate, which is something that. Uh, optional rules in Dungeons and Dragons don't do. I mean, there's there's things that there's rules that people gravitate toward. Flanking is a great example of an optional rule that I didn't know was optional for the longest time. Nat ones and uh, nat twenties are another thing. Like nat ones being an automatic fail and nat twenties being an automatic success is an optional rule. You're right. Yeah. So there's there's definitely some some popular ones that I think are driven by the the culture surrounding the the tables. So when you when you look at like view your table in a little microcosm and you've created these rules that people are getting used to and, and feeling comfortable with, now look at the broader uh, RPG space where people talk to each other, they have some sort of interaction. You see videos saying like, oh, this is the best way to do this other thing. And then it kind of bleeds slowly, given enough time, uh, effort, and uh, popularity that it kind of trickles into other uh, elements of the game. And when you see uh, Dungeons and Dragons 2024, it's very likely going to accommodate some of these, uh, the way that people play the game now versus the way that they intent, intended to design it way back. I don't think that a lot of new systems are in the same space. It's kind of apple, apples to oranges because you have, you know, D&D has just such a prolific uh, history, you know, 50 years, and um, and then have those very uh, specific spikes in interest given, you know, Critical Role, Stranger Things. And for other games, in order to to set expectations, 
Like if I say, hey, we're going to play Call of Cthulhu, you know what kind of experience that's going to be. If I say, hey, we're going to play 10 Candles, you know your character is going to die because that's the point of the game. And uh, I think that when you're changing that base experience and wanting everybody to get on board, there's probably two routes. The first of which is like you're doing with your, your homebrew rules, leaking them in. The second is to choose a new system so that everybody's on the same page. When we're talking about homebrew. We're usually talking about homebrewing 5e. And we're mm. usually talking about 5e specifically because it is by far the most popular whatever. Like even if you're playing Tales of the Valiant or Pugmire, it's it's like that you we could argue if they're separate systems, but they're at least 5e adjacent. Like you said, a lot of the resolution mechanics, advantage is borrowed in both of those games. So again, it's it's like the the ship of Theseus. Like how much of the system has to change before it's its own system and it's identifiable enough as its own system. Uh, what would be the first line that you draw if you were to take 5e and feel so strongly about a change that you've made that it warrants a new system? Action economy. Yeah, like, action economy. That, okay. I yeah, think we already so, kind of like pointed to that. Well, uh, yeah. And the reason I say that is uh, having played Pathfinder, the three action economy is so elegant. Like it's just, they did a good job with it. The reason I say the three action economy is because the most confusion I've seen and when players are thinking, what would my character do? They have to filter it through the lens of the three action economy. And a lot of times players won't do what their character would do because the three, uh, because D and D's or fifth edition's action economy doesn't allow them to. Like, it's like, I wouldn't search the area because that costs my action. So I can't do anything else on my turn. Whereas the the three action economy just changes the way that they think about what's possible and how they sequence their choices. Um, and also how easy it is to make decisions. <laughs> like mm. the, the, the problem with fifth edition having like one action and then possibly a bonus action is your character build a lot of times tends to go more toward the bonus action than the action. Because the action is just like, I'm going to swing my weapon or hit with a spell. So really, when you're picking like different class features or multi-class builds or, or something, a lot of times this is where like, you know, we've talked about optimization in the past, but I find that a lot of times my players will optimize because they want to be able for their character to do the thing that their character would actually do. And they can't do that with the restriction of one action per turn. Uh, that's a good point. I mean, it all comes down to, to feel. Mm. And this is one of those things where the mechanics kind of point to what you want the players to or what experience you want the players to have uh it's funny that you brought up you brought up earlier uh changing the dice like that's that is absolutely 100 percent one of the reasons why Daggerheart is 2d10 2d12 uh, 2d something and oh, uh, uh, yeah 2d12 i think and then then mcdm is also uh like it was 2d6 but then they potentially doing 2d10 distancing yourself from the D20 is is a really good way to create an identifiably different product. Right. And I think that's what a lot of conversation uh, or what, what a lot of this conversation kind of comes down to, at least if you're trying to create a new system for the purposes of being a commercial product, is that it's, it's easier to be identifiable uh, as something uh, self-contained when it doesn't have similar beats to, mm. you know, the largest competitors in the world. So I, I think at this point, just to keep track, math, mechanics or rather uh dice core dice resolution um action economy yeah and uh and i would say even i don't know, I, I still think setting is a is a strong component but you it seems like you need multiple things at this point to kind of like make that jump uh to to a new product this is another reason why like I'm not focused on setting as much. So earlier I brought up Eberron and how like you're still playing Dungeons and Dragons if you're playing an Eberron. And let's say you take Pathfinder mechanics and Eberron is just your setting. You can do that. Like it'll feel different because you're playing a different system, but the the setting of Eberron is separate from like the mechanics of D&D. &D. They're not intrinsic to each other. I do know that there are other games where that is not true. Um, when I was talking to uh, a friend 
uh, Jackson from True Sight RPGs. Uh, he told me about Simba Room. Um, and he's like, you can't take Simba Room setting and just like slap Dungeons and Dragons mechanics onto it. It won't be the right. same feel. They're more intrinsically tied. So I, I do not necessarily the setting, but one thing can be how the settings mechanics specifically tie to the system that you're uh, you're creating. I think it's the when when your uh, your homebrew uh, doesn't mesh mm. and f- and take on the the feeling of the original game, then it's probably time to make a new game. Yeah, um, example that comes to mind is uh, a few years ago. At this point, there was a a, a GM that wanted to run a five E game and. What they said is that the game is going to be dark, gritty. Um, there's a the world is going to be highly threatening, and you know that first of all um, changed my approach to character creation. I was very careful with the way that it progresses. The other thing that ended up happening is yes, the world was threatening until about level five, <laughs> and then there was a shift mechanically because, as we know in fifth edition as the there's there's like a threshold that's not very uh late (laughs) it's a very early threshold that the player characters cross where suddenly they go from being threatened to being the threat and it was interesting because the gm was like oh yeah i've got this really threatening world and i'm like yeah was threatening (laughs) just because of the way that i don't know the spells that you get access to at level five and level seven um so there was it was it was just interesting because there was a point where 5e's mechanics couldn't tell the story that they wanted without significant changes that i don't think the gm was comfortable making at the time and i don't think the players were ready um to learn the changes that would need to be adopted in order to maintain the the tone that the gm wanted to set I, i think that they could have done it with 5e I just think there needed to be some some house rules or homebrew. So like just even saying you can't multi-class would have changed a lot or um, no one can pick healing spells like healing doesn't work. That would really change the dynamic, but without really changing the system. You know, it's it's funny to use it when you when you bring up uh, removing healing spells. I think a, a dangerous uh part of of homebrew is having access to so much official material Mm. that says you can do one thing and then having a gm which i feel constrained by the books uh i'll make up like uh, i think all of my campaigns have taken place in a homebrew world because that's that's easy and i probably have permission to do that because because even 5e doesn't have like a, a real uh setting that everything feels super tightly tied to uh but when it comes to mechanics i have a hard time closing off doors it's it's difficult to close doors to them because they see and maybe might even own you know books uh that have this material that they potentially want to play so if if there are strong feelings one way or the other like you're trying to create a different experience or create something that is like you know uh, just fundamentally different then homebrew is probably not going to get you all the way there or will Mm -hmm. get you there but not for very long at some point the game the game changes uh that's you know one of the reasons why high level play in D &D is kind of like it doesn't really work you know it's just kind of fun um is is one of those things where i don't know i guess D &D was was intended to to be able to play uh, at high levels but it just kind of broke down due to you know not getting to do that enough probably in testing and and then also just like some uh kind of sins of our father's thing where you have to kind of grandfather in some of these um older spells just because they're very familiar you know things like um uh, wall of force and um e- even like pass wall and, and that sort of stuff wish where, simulacrum wish. exactly <laughs> yep. yep so like that stuff from older editions like yeah it's it's really cool it was a cool fun idea that like now we just have to deal with yeah I, the game wasn't built to support your homebrew from start to finish so maybe that's a point of evaluation too so the, one of the other reasons I want to ask the question, I've been tinkering with my own system. And one of the motivators for that was exactly what you said. Um, pretty much all my players at my table own all the books. Um, so they can flip through and the, like, they're like, oh, Tasha's has Dream of the Blue Veil. And it's like, 
that's a very specific spell really more for gms than players to access um and what was happening was my players were picking these spells that were really inappropriate to the kind of game i wanted the level of threat that i wanted my world to have so rather than continue to try to play 5e and just tell them no I was like, well, I might as well also, I, there, these are other changes I would want to see to 5e system, so let me take a whack at it. And that includes paring down a lot of the options. Another one that would happen, um, and this is a, a weakness of 5e, is that there were spells players would take because it was hard to evaluate what spells were worth taking and not taking. Oh, um, I mean, man, I love Longstrider. Actually, Longstrider is not a It will be better in 2024. Spell. Yeah, um, long, I, I, I've I've come around on Long Strider and Jump. Actually, they they I think they have a place. Um, Good. I don't think if you have Good. two it's been a long time coming. spells known that the only spells you should take are Long Strider and Jump. Well, I agree to disagree. <laughs> but <laughs> like, uh, my my point is, I actually did do this recently, where I, I told my players, "Hey, listen, there are some very specific concerns I have about." Um, as we enter 13th level, especially, and you get 7th level spells, I'm going to make a master list of spells you're not allowed to take. And it was it started as a conversation, and it was it was setting that expectation, like you mentioned. It was very tone-based. Um, one of the ones I, I uh, outlawed was Banishment. Banishment, not Banish. Um, because I was like, I'm doing something different with the Outer Planes. So it doesn't make sense to have all these options that interact with the outer planes if I'm doing something different with them. Um, another one was just teleport. I I'm like, teleport, teleportation circle. Something's happened with magic in this world so that you can't long distance teleport on a whim. Um, the, the other big one was the conjure series. So like conjure woodland beings, conjure animals. And the reason was in my experience, players would always like summon eight additional units on the board and it would just clog up the grid, clog up the action economy. Like, in, it, I think that the spell would be fine if they were using, I don't know, like send out eight animal messengers or something like that. Like that use of it would be fine, but it ended up not making sense for the type of game and what parts of the game we really enjoyed. So it, it can be tough, but I feel like the only reason I pulled it off is I've been playing with the same players for eight years. And they have, they have demonstrated that if I make some kind of change, they can adopt to it. But like you said, I don't think that's a majority of tables. Yeah, well, and isn't it more fun to, isn't it more fun to say yes than it is to tell people, no, sorry, not that one. And I think that that's one of the, the benefits of, of having a new system is that you can say like, look at all this cool stuff. Yeah. What would you like to do versus like, no, 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 not that one. No, it doesn't really work. Uh, Silvery Barb's kind of overpowered. Like, you know, those sorts of uh, situations. And yeah, if you can get your table on board, I mean, it's a lot of work to create a new system, but if you can get your table on board with playing it, I think that's a better option. Yeah, um, I, I'm kind of on the fence. So, and the reason why is I am pretty deep into Act 3 of Baldur's Gate 3. And something that's really interesting is actually given the breadth of 5e's options how little options they actually give you so i had a bard hit level 11 which means that they get access to sixth level spells and if you look at the bard list in like the player's handbook there's like a bunch but in baldur's gate there's two at least the way my bard was built yeah. and what was interesting is you know being the observer of me as a player like kind of that metacognition thing I was, uh, I found it interesting knowing that there were less options, how much clearer my choices were to make and how much more satisfied I was with the choices I make. So there are a lot of times I actually feel if you pare down the options, it actually sometimes leads to better experiences, um, which is counterintuitive. Usually people homebrew because they want to add a bunch of things to the game. Um, but I do wonder if sometimes if you if you can sit down with your players and say, we're only going to use these options, how much easier it is for them to make choices that they like. I, I can I can totally see that. I guess it's just writing that line between um, what what's this, the the tone of the game and kind of like the 
the general feel you're trying to achieve and uh and what what will still keep your players excited instead of disappointed for me i, I think that's creating a new system only because i'm doing it you know you don't you don't have to do this don't don't worry about it at home uh but creating a new system i i feel has been really liberating because i i like okay as a designer i like to consider all the the different options and what people will have access to and i've also been game designer on a game that is more than 10 years old and i know the the problem that you have with bloat over time to where like yeah you have to put out an update it's got to have some new stuff in it if you want to you know keep people interested and that accumulates it's a sort of uh accretion disc surrounding the the core of the experience and uh being able to create a new game kind of gives you a baseline to start over from and you know if distal in particular kept expanding and evolving and uh, it might end up in the same situation as uh dungeons and dragons where yeah you know tasha's totally changes everything xanathar's totally you know gives you a bunch of new options but uh that's also i guess why there's there's new additions too it took 10 years between uh you know, 2014 and 2024, but that's honestly, that's a pretty good timeline, uh, for, for a new product and given just all the content that's kind of been released. The downside is that like, you also have the old content to kind of like weirdly compete with, uh, you know, from 2024 and just like the, however many books you own and people are going to want to, uh, at some tables, you know, pull experiences from the past instead of getting to start from baseline. Like, wouldn't it be nice if, D&D 2024 was not backwards compatible and we just which you know I, I make the argument that it's not really but um but even just like shedding that that skin and saying hey new game we we identified all the best ways or the uh, the most popular you know methods for play at the table and that's the experience that we want to give you you know loosen up on right now you know in 2020 or 2014 um, they're trying to account for all sorts of different possibilities even stuff like travel which yeah probably still makes sense to have a rules and four i uh, there's there's like a bunch of extra space devoted to things that don't really get a lot of traffic and in a new system you can narrow down and say what rules actually matter what is the experience that we're trying to to offer like what's the the core of it and uh and what will people be excited to play because third-party creators homebrew that's always going to be able to kind of build on a system uh, i mean if the system is set up to support it correctly but it's, it's very difficult to to take away and when i think about creating a new game video game or otherwise to me it's the best opportunity that you have to start over yeah. one other way they could do it and uh, silvery barbs you brought up earlier it's actually a really good example of this is you just have a core kind of generic system and for all the specific things you just very clearly make them setting specific um so silvery barbs was part of strixhaven curriculum of chaos which is a very specific setting slash adventure book um there this is also a cultural thing um because you could just buy or you used to in a la carte buy silvery barbs by itself but there should be like an understanding that it's like you don't just use silvery barbs, right? You use silvery barbs when we play Strixhaven, you know, you play a Warforged when we play Eberron because that is like a Eberron specific um, option. So rather than thinking of it as, well, I can be a Warforged from Eberron that knows silvery barbs from Strixhaven that knows frost fingers from Icewind Dale. Like you, you look at, what's the tone of the game and then what options are turned on as opposed to assuming they're all turned on and then having the GM be the bad guy to tell them actually in this game, it's turned off. Um, it, it, the, and I think we're in agreement here. I feel like the, the most fun games that I've played are specific. So, um, you know, when you play curse of Strahd, there is a certain feeling tone and there's a specific mood, specific aesthetic, um, coming in as a Triceratops person that's a soul knife rogue multi-classed with a druid that can wild shape into a, an octopus, like, and then trying to solve all the puzzles in a really goofy fashion, it's just not going to fit Strahd. Yeah, it could be fun. You could laugh a lot, but like, it's just, 
you're not really committing to what that adventure has on offer. Um, and so I wonder if like culturally and, and the books could even like nudge this and some of them may even, but just, Hey, these options are not just automatically turned on. Like your, your GM can, if they want, um, but these options are designed for this specific setting or this specific type of adventure. Do you think that we settled on any any sort of harder guidelines for when you should take your campaign or your uh, your system off of five e, you know your your homebrew and potentially branch it into a system of your own? The indicators, which you've been kind of keeping track of as a checklist, uh, that separate, you know, you've just done some homebrew tweaks, or I don't know, even I, I was reflecting on this. So in Distal, one of the core elements that gets brought up over and over again is the genius of the background prompts, like the various tables that you roll on to generate your character's story. Um, and we've spoken about this uh, privately, which is just, I could see myself, like, even if I have players that aren't willing to learn Distal, but they want to play 5e, I could see myself taking those background prompts and using them to help my players create characters that feel original. Um so that would be like an example of a homebrew system I would pull from one game to another. Um, but the elements that I think that start to really differentiate, whether it's its own system, is the game's underlying math, um, the resolution mechanic, like the dice that you're rolling and what the results mean, um, action economy, and the last one is uh, character progression like how characters progress, how much power they gain at each level up if you're using levels um, or if you're doing a class list system, you know, the rate that they get perks or new abilities or whatever you call that. I feel like those are like the four pillars that if you're starting to really tinker with those, um, now you're you're not homebrewing. You're, you're creating something new. All right. Well, I think that's all we got for, for this week. Thank you so much for uh, for hanging out. If you have an idea for what this podcast should be called, please put it in the comments. We are at a loss for uh, for names. I've seen a lot of them in the Discord so far, but um, I don't know. Still looking. Uh, thanks very much, folks. We're all signing off.